What's going on, y'all? Hey, so this is a clip from a longer documentary that we're doing uh, on the Retro Tech channel. Now, if you guys haven't gone over and subscribed to the Retro Tech channel, I highly recommend you go do that. If you're interested at all in cultivation, genetics, strains, cultivars, the history behind those, the breeders, please, guys, go over to Retro Tech, the YouTube channel, go subscribe, go follow us on those social medias. Uh, big shouts out to Breeder Steve, big shouts out to the uh, Retro Tech lead. Hugh, my boy Hugh, who's been doing a great job leading the charge. And uh, yeah, guys, make sure to go subscribe. Like I said, Retro Tech Stories, Retro Tech Research more so. And yeah, guys, really appreciate y'all. Hope you guys enjoy this. And uh, I'll see you over there on Retro Tech. So I felt like that was important. And to make seed that was relatively easy to grow, you know, that became something for me that I really like to put them up against natural selection every summer and let the weather weed them out. And then I do two indoor generations of selections. So a lot of the stuff that I started breeding early on, like the sweet tooth and shishkaberry and blue domino and that, people said, man, these work really good inside and outside. But it's because I did selections both ways, you know? So, and a lot of stuff that's good inside just melts when you try it outside. And a lot of outdoor stuff isn't the best you can do indoor either. So, I mean, you can focus on one or the other if that's what you want to do. But if you kind of want to make a super easy to grow plant that works both, you know, you've got to do some outdoor selections because you really find the hardiest plants that way. And inside they're coddled and they never see rain or real wind or anything, you know, so, or there's many different pests and whatnot. So I think uh, indoors it doesn't give you the harsh reality of outdoors when it comes to selection, you know. So I really get a kick out of that. And I mean, it's nice to be able to look at them indoors and not worry about which plants are erect and which plants are floppy and stuff like that. Because maybe outside I want to breed stuff that stands up on its own so I don't have to stake everything or net everything. Whereas indoors you might say, it doesn't matter, scrog, I can grow anything that's floppy and grows like a vine. So if it's got the specific taste you want, it's okay. This is the plant that most approaches the ideal. You know, this is what I'm looking for in this line. So indoors, that can be your only consideration if you want. I'm just going to take you're the one with the highest THC or whatever your thought is, you know, whatever you're trying to focus on. But once you put them back outside again, you can kind of go with, let's just see who survives. No, and then, and then you get a, a hardy generation in there. You know? So it's a, the more extreme sometimes the weather, the more extreme the results. But it's also a matter of using large populations when you do that. And that's why it, the indoor space is expensive to operate. So you don't want to lay out 100,000 seeds indoors all the time. It's you, know, you might want to, but it's just so so expensive. Unless you're really doing a huge amount of indoor seed sales, you might be better off just putting 100,000 seeds in a field for next to nothing and then picking out the winners. You take cuttings. Yeah, take cuttings of your favorites as they're coming along. I used to want to take cuttings of everything before I put it out for flower or whatnot. And that is the ideal if you can do that. But if you're starting with huge numbers, what I found I would do which narrowed it down quite quickly, but is that I would start trays of seeds. So maybe the trays have 50 seed in a tray or something, right? So 75 seed, whatever size your trays are. I would start those seeds. I don't need to number them yet, you know? But after a week, you know, or whenever they look like they're ready to get moved, I would just take the nicest 20, 25%. So let's say 25%. You know, if you start... 10,000 seeds, I'm going to take 2,500 of the nicest seedlings. Maybe I'm looking for purple stalks because I know that pheno. You know, there might be something you're looking for even at a young age that you can start to see, you know. And even uh, you can start smelling those plants too. And if you've got a decent nose, you'll be able to start smelling them. Now, it'd be great if you can do some sequencing as well. Once you start having targeted markers you're looking for, then it gets a whole other level of efficiency, right? So you've got identified markers and little leaf punch samples 
to have them analyzed and read at a short age for something specific, whether you know it was purple green or THC or CBD or whatever you're looking for, that you can separate the populations early with that. But anyway, if if you take out the first trace, a quarter of the population, and you put them into like 10 centimeter, four inch pots, another two weeks go by, you take out the best, you know, you had 10,000 seeds, so you had 2,500 in little pots. Well, you can be inside or greenhouse or outside. It's just propagation when you're starting the seeds. So you could take the um, ones in these, the first little pots, the four inch 10 centimeter pots, then take 500 of those, 20%. You got 500 plants to go into maybe one gallon pots, you know, and they can, you know, four liter pots and they could sit there for another two or three weeks. And by then you're probably able to start sexing them in that too. But you take just the best hundred of those and put them in the field, you know, so you've already narrowed down 10,000 seeds to 100 to go into the field and hopefully having sexed them a bit too. And for quick sexing, if, if they're at that size and I'm not certain, what I'll even do is maybe take two trays of cuttings and I'll take a cut from the bottom of each of those promising ones out of the 500, the best 100, 125, whatever, probably 100. But I take the cuts of those and one of the trays, I would just keep under the lights regular for a backup clone. And the other one, I would put under 1212 rooting shelf so that by the time they're rooted, they've sexed. So you can just see which one is which, right? So you, you don't have to wait till the whole plant is showing if you don't want it. You can just take off some sucker branches on the bottom and just put them in like you're trying to root them. You don't care if they root. You just want them to sex, right? So you just put them into a tray in a dome, but put them on 1212. So they're not plants you're keeping as backup cuttings. You have those somewhere else on a longer light schedule, you know? Whereas, but if you just want to sex plants quick, you can just take a little cut off the bottom as though you're making cuttings, but not not really worried about them. You know, if you just want to see them survive for 10 to 12 days with the light change. Well, the cutting will start to flower if it's on 12-12. So the cutting will flower like while it's, rooting right so it's a shortcut you don't have to you know root it and then flower it just keep a little section where you can root cuts on 12 12 and that lets you sex them before they're even rooted you know absolutely no i would at least pick out one or two males at least one obviously it, unless there's nothing good about it. If I think, oh, I don't really love this line, I mean, I'm not keeping a mail of it, you know. If, but if it's something I know that I like and I've worked with, and um, the point is to find a good male or two as much as to find a good female or two, right? So it's, it's easier to tell what the female's like than the male, but they still share some of the same characteristics and essentially like the gets alike. So you, you're just always picking towards the ones that give you the closest uh, representation of what your vision is for that line. So if you want one that tastes like purple lollipops, you got to uh, rub the stalks, smell all the males, and decide which one of these smells most like purple lollipops, you know? Because you're going to find that female with it too. You know, the bare minimum of line breeding is to keep two lines of any anything you're doing. So if you had Say you found the one male that was obviously the male. It was absolutely a dead ringer for purple lollipops, and it was resinous and beautiful male. So you're just thinking, okay, this is easily the stud dad here. But the two females, you're like, man, these are both good, but they're slightly different. I can't quite decide. You know, I can use them both and have one pollen on those two females makes two new lines. And it could be... I'm not sure about these two males, one or the other is, they're both awesome, but this female's number one. I can make two closets and make one with one male and one with the other male, and then you keep those lines. So every three generations, to keep them from becoming inbred, you would just cross those two lines again. So whatever you're working on, that's how you maintain vigor in it in the long term, you know? Because if you just keep going, F4, F5, F6, F7, 
depending on what you start with, but you know the the less stable it is, the longer you can get away with that, basically. But the but as it becomes totally stable, and then it becomes inbred to just keep hitting itself, you know. So it's a uh, there's many ways to go breeding, but the essential old fashioned line breeding that's it in a nutshell, really, you know.